The Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by these great sponsors. Are you looking to value your equipment more accurately? Target the right buyers and close more deals? Reach your ideal customer? Then look no further. Fusible isn't just about ag data. It's about action. Our best-in-class solution empowers you to value your equipment accurately, make informed decisions, and find the perfect prospects. Ignite your dealership's growth at fusible.com slash moving iron dash podcast. Out in the field, every decision counts. You wouldn't plant without testing your soil, so why would you prospect blind? Introducing EDA, your one-stop shop for ag equipment intel. EDA goes beyond specs and prices. You get deep dive data on every piece of equipment like UCC filings that help track ownership changes and uncover potential sales leads. D&B firmographics, which help you understand the financial health and buying power of potential customers. Market trends that help you stay ahead of the curve and insights on equipment demands and pricings. With EDA, you're not just looking at data, you're seeing opportunity. You find the right buyer, sell smarter, and build lasting relationships. Visit edadata.com for your free demo and unlock the power of knowledge. For over 80 years, Iron Solutions has been your go-to data source for ag dealers, lenders, and manufacturers. Get powerful appraisal and value forecasting tools that fuel profitable decisions anytime, anywhere. Get your free demo at ironsolutions.com. Iron Solutions, confidence in every click. Today, there are many ways to finance ag equipment. But nobody delivers simple, fast, or flexible financing like AgDirect. Learn more about your options to buy, lease, and refinance equipment at agdirect.com. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 for all your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. When you partner with Axon, you immediately gain access to a full range of products and solutions designed to meet the complex needs of today's grower. We carry all major brands and sizes of tires and wheels. We specialize in large diameter wheels for large equipment. We have one of the largest OEM replacement wheel inventories in North America. Known for extreme flotation setups, duals, and triples, we have wheels for all makes and models of tractors, sprayers, combines, and grain carts. If we don't have the wheel in stock, we'll custom build, sandblast, and paint in-house. There isn't a more vast inventory in North America dedicated to helping dealers move more iron. With facilities on the West Coast and in the heart of the Midwest, leverage our 230,000 square feet of indoor inventory to solve any problem a grower may have. Move more iron with Axon. Moving iron in the 21st century. Hardworking people working hard for you and me. Moving iron time and time again. Through the years you'll find us here. To Moving Iron Podcast Markets with Chip Nellinger. Chip Nellinger is with Blue Reef Agri-Marketing out of Morton, Illinois. It's nice enough to come on and talk about what's happening in the world of commodities. Chip, how are you doing? Good, it's Casey. Good. How are you doing? Doing good, Chip. Doing good. Um, a lot of stuff going on in the marketplace. This is a, a bit of a, it's a weird, weird environment we're living in now where you just, the, you can sense the uncertainty, right? There's just, like you could cut it with a knife there's so much uncertainty out there and it's just and it's thick yeah and so and i think the corn market is a good representation of that right you had you had a wazi report come out um last week and for all intents and purposes it felt pretty pretty positive like it wasn't like a screaming bearish or bullish but it was just right there if things moved you had some things happen you saw corn take a good run up after that uh was report came out but then this just keeps the last two weeks, three weeks has kind of been flirting with this. It's 405, 407, then it worked its way down to 395, 392, and then it worked its way back up to 407. It's just this constant back and forth. When you see markets like this, what are you thinking and, and what's this an indicator of? Yeah, typically it's an indication that we have found a value area, right? Um, we've had a huge move down. 
you mentioned the USDA WASDE report uh, showed record yields. Um, you know, I mean, I'm not talking like a little bit uh, of a record. You know, corn would be, I don't know, six, seven bushels above what we've ever raised before. Um, and so the market, uh, that wasn't unexpected, right? I mean, we'd, right. the market had kind of been trading that way that, you know, hey, this could be a 182, 183 type crop. We got that confirmation. The fact that we kind of bottomed on bearish news uh, up until today and found some, some, some bounce in it. A, we were oversold. B, we are starting to see a lot of demand, and um, you know we're we're selling a fair amount. We're grinding uh, ethanol at a near record pace, and so lower prices help you know kind of reprime the demand pump, and and you're starting to see that. I think that's some of the the back and forth that we've stopped this waterfall, you know, ten lower every two days type of a trade, um, and now we're getting a little back and forth type price action. Um, and I think the market, like you mentioned, uncertain. We've got the Pro Farmer Crop Tour next week. Um, that's going to kind of be the first real foray into the crop uh, to act, take actual um, you know, yields. They, the USA does not do that in August. So that was still based off of surveys and, and opinion. In the September report here a month from now, the USDA will start actually walking into fields, counting ears, counting kernels, weighing ears, and we'll have a, a little better idea of, of what's happened. Now, on top of that, here at the at the end of the week, we're getting some weakness. We've had some tremendous rains move through, especially the eastern Corn Belt, the last uh, 48 hours. And yeah. and those are really going to finish off a lot of crops. Uh, it's 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 what we needed. It's right on time. I mean, you couldn't have uh, scripted it any better for um, you know yields in this in this area. So I think it's the market trying to figure out. Um, what do we have? Is it a record? Are we going to have to shave it back a little bit? Are they going to have to go back up in um, in September and, and increase that a little bit? And in the same breath, we've dropped far enough that you are starting to see, um, even from the bean side, we've seen China in there as a as a buyer of U.S. beans the last uh, uh, three weeks, and uh, and our bean exports have picked up. In fact, they were above the highest estimate uh, on Thursday's export sales report. It's been a long time since. You could say that about beans, right? That we, oh, right. But, you know, usually it's the other way. We're below the lowest estimate. And so the big price drop is starting to stimulate the demand. It's just now a function of how big is big. Have we seen the highest um, yield numbers from the USDA? Do they have to shave that back? Pro Farmer Crop Tour next week will give a little more. It won't give us the final answer, but it'll give us another piece of information for the market to chew on in that regards. Right. So as you look at this, how how are planted acres going into into this mix, right? Yeah, there's a huge crop, but we don't have as many acres planted. So I guess how does that look on balance sheets? Yeah, you know that's what kept uh, the corn market together. Um, uh, you know, was a uh, 800,000 acre cut in planted acres. The USDA on the August report um, used some of the RMA data as far as um, you know certification of acres as well as prevent plant. Uh, and so they cut corn acres by 800,000. So that somewhat offset the yield increase. Demand was bumped up just a little bit, as often happens when prices are, are you know, going lower. And so it kind of held the carryout together in the corn. And I think that's why, you know, as you dipped under $4, you saw some better buying and, and, and the market held together. Now it's kind of the opposite on beans. We increased yield and we also increased the planted acres by a million. And that really was... Uh, the kiss of death for the bean market. And you, and you saw that huge move lower on the report day a week ago um, because that just, you know, swelled the ending stocks. Uh, I think it was 560 million. That was like a 28% increase in the ending stocks because of the yield bump and a million more acres. And, and that really um, was what was most bearish for the bean market and probably most bearish on that entire report was the bean side because you, you did get that bump up in acres as well as the yield increase. Right on. Okay, so now let's jump over and talk about soybeans. We've been hitting that a little bit, and we've been seeing what what's going on in Brazil, going back into another very dry planting season. Um, both Monte Grosso and Prana are both very dry right now. Subsoil moistures are very dry. Obviously, it is a, a dry time of the year for them, but it's, it's abnormally dry um, from where it should be. So you're planting into that. They're... They can't seem to clear the 
reinforced fast enough to plant more soybeans. So I guess as you're as you're looking at this scenario and how this thing unfolds, what are your thoughts about the long term soybean market going into this 2024 2025 market? Yeah, a lot, lot of questions there, obviously, with Brazil. That's kind of like the, uh, you know, 800,000-pound elephant in the room. Uh, yeah. They're expected to increase acres down there. They've had four um, crop problems in a row of varying degrees, um, you know, led by La Nina and the, and the rapid swings from La Nina to El Nino. Uh, right. Still dry, as you mentioned, but it's still early enough that the market isn't caring about that just yet. Now, they will, as you get into like October, November, uh, they will start caring more um, once they start uh, planters rolling down there and get that crop in the ground. Then, obviously, it becomes a real situation. Um, on paper, it's a problem because if you assume a little bit of, a, of an acreage push in Brazil and a normal yield, uh, they're going to raise over a 6 billion bushel bean crop. That compares to uh, ours at uh, what, like something like 4.3, 4.4 um, uh, billion bushels. So on paper, uh, Brazil could raise a monstrous crop down there. Now, will Mother of Nature allow that? I don't know. Uh, but that is something that's kind of hanging out there as, uh, you know, a potential, uh, you know, catastrophic event. I mean, that would just surge world carryout, right? And we already have right. our carryout bumping up closer to 600 million versus, you know, 24 months ago, that was, uh, there was a threat that was going to be, you know, maybe one of the tightest ever under 150 million. So world stocks, U.S. stocks moving higher on paper, Brazil could, could swamp the world with beans, but we know mother nature is going to have the final say so in that. And, you know, will they cooperate? Will, will mother nature cooperate on uh, rainfall and temperatures to allow that big crop down there? is anyone's guess, but it, it's certainly something that, uh, you know, I think you should, odds would say, after four problems in a row, that they're going to bounce back with a normal crop. You have to assume a normal crop, and if they have a normal crop, that's going to be uh, far too many beans in the world uh, about six months down the road. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that is the, you put it right, the 800,000 pound grill in the room there, because it's, there, there's so much, there's so much there that, if they just had a half a crop, it would be a mega amount of uh, soybeans that hit hit the market all at the same time. Yeah, and that's 30, not even counting, yeah. you know, that we're not even talking about Argentina, Paraguay, right. Uruguay. Mm -hmm. They raise beans too, and a fair amount yeah. of them. Uh, we're just talking about Brazil potentially plant, uh, producing 6 billion bushels of beans. Um, China's lot. usage has gone up on a pretty exponential straight line, but... Um, if they realize a six plus million bushel bean crop in Brazil, um, production will be going up much faster than what uh, demand out of uh, China, you know, can sustain. Yep. All right, man, let's jump over and talk about what's going on over in the cattle market. You've seen uh, box beef prices come up. You've seen um, some volatility on the, uh, on the cattle side of stuff. So I guess as you're looking at the cattle market chip, as we head into this, you know, Labor Day, kind of big hurrah here grilling season thing plus all the other financial stuff we have on top of that what are your thoughts yeah it's a lot like the corn market um only a mirror image right in my opinion um corn had this huge break you're finally starting to see some demand um and stabilizing things choppy trade in cattle but we've had this big run up multiple years drought uh, you know culling the the cow herd uh, for multiple years, this is a five, six year deal, it's tight, you know, some of the tightest numbers on feed we've had uh, in history. Uh, we're, we're feeding them a lot heavier, right? Almost 40 pounds heavier than a year ago. So that's offsetting some of the tightness. But it feels to me like uh, the cattle market, the beef market is at kind of an equilibrium here. Um, the cash markets held together pretty well in the upper 180s. Uh, the box beef has had some volatility here, but it's holding together. Um, you know, we, we saw a good export sales number uh, this week. I think it was a marketing year high for beef, so that's a good thing. But there's some signs out here that the economy is starting to slow. And I think that and this, this whole yen carry trade that created a yeah. massive amount of volatility in the financial markets a couple weeks back, I think yep. that kind of signaled the funds who had been long cattle essentially for three years or more. Um, let's kind of pair our position back here a little bit. It's okay to stay long. 
but we don't need as big a position. And so I, I think here in the in the low to mid 180s, it feels like the cattle market is comfortable sitting there, kind of seeing what's going to happen into the third and fourth quarter on the cash markets and, and what box beef can do and whether the consumer, we've been talking about this for two years, it feels like these high near record prices of not only beef, but everything, you know, everything that is out there from fuel, rent, uh, interest rates going up, you know, food prices increasing. Can the consumer hold it together? And can we continue to see domestic demand strong in the third and fourth quarter, um, uh, you know, is, is a big unknown. But for now, it feels like um, the cattle market is, is at a pretty good value. The cash market's been way above where we're at. So there's a, a premium there that kind of holds things together uh, on the futures. And as long as the cash market can kind of stay in the in the mid 180s, I, I think that uh, we're probably on pretty good footing um, in the cattle market. And, and that's kind of what we need, really, um, is just to kind of reach a level that is equilibrium and, you know, producers can make a little bit of money. Uh, the demand holds together and you can kind of extend this thing. Uh, but I, I think that the cattle market always has one eye on the stock market and the economy, and that's going to be the big question. Can we hold this thing together? I mean, the numbers on some of these economic uh, reports that have come out, it just sometimes boggles your mind, given you know the price increases out there that it appears the consumer's holding together, but my brain... Um, and probably your brain and anybody that thinks logically uh, is sitting out there saying, hey, I, I go out, I take my family to Chick-fil-A and I go to the grocery store and I don't know how much longer the, the consumer can hold it together. That's my fear. But uh, on paper, according to the government, and they're always there to help you, um, <laughs> everything's pretty good with the economy right now on, yes. on all uh, – all systems go, Casey. I don't know why they'd be lying to us three months before yeah. an election. The last, the last um, press conference I saw that was they had created the strongest economy ever. So I'm, I'd hate to see what it looked like when this week. If it was the weakest ever. Um, yeah. No, I can't yeah. even comment on that. That would that would take this uh, that would take this podcast to a uh, you know maybe an R rating. Oh, it's already there, so don't don't worry about that. So, <laughs> uh, so let's jump over and look at the hog market real quick. It's similar, feels like similar dynamics are going on there as well. Your thoughts? Yeah, um, similar, but I think uh, the one thing you haven't seen, um, you, you, you saw a lot of liquidation, but uh, two things are happening. Um, you know, in the cattle market, the, the liquidation really happened, and although we're feeding them a lot heavier, um, it's not really offset the liquidation of the cow herd over the last three or four years because of the drought scenario. You've seen some hog liquidation, but uh, A, we are, they're pretty heavy. We're feeding them heavy. And B, the, the U.S. hog producers gotten really efficient. I think we've kind of fixed some of these health and disease problems that we had. Uh, the pigs per litter has just been um, on fire. And, and so even though there's been sow liquidation, we're producing more and we're feeding them heavier. And that's been a real um, weight around the neck of the hog market. We've seen some counter seasonal moves. Um, we tried to rally the hog market. They, they puked them back hard and, and they just can't seem to get much going. And I think it's just a, a supply issue where, the U.S. producer has become uh, wildly efficient uh, on the breeding side, and and cheap corn, their feed and and meal, uh, they're feeding them heavier, trying to get a little bit uh, of profit, um, you know, in it from that side, feeding them heavier, and and that's uh, that's really um, kept the lid on prices, unfortunately. So it's not quite as bright a spot as uh, maybe what the cattle market is, and um, you know, to top that off, this week we had a marketing year low in pork sales. Still pretty good at, at 20,000 um, uh, tons and change, but that was a marketing year low. And that is the one thing that's that's kind of helped hold the, the hog market together is we've been really, really good um, at, at exporting pork. And so there's a lot of volatility in these meat export sales reports from week to week. 
but what you want to look for is is that is that one off and we're going to bounce back with a good number next week or is this the start of a trend if that's the start of a trend then we're going to really struggle on um, on pork exports going forward uh, that is a troubling sign but right now I'm, i think it could be more of a one-off event but it's certainly something we need to watch going into the end of august and the first part of september here awesome all right, Chip, good place to stop. Uh, folks want to reach out to you, get more information about what you're doing over at Blue Reef Agri-Marketing. What's the best place to do that? Yeah, best place is probably just give us a call, uh, 309-550-7213. Love to chat with you. Um, you know, a lot of stuff happening here in the markets. Even though prices are, uh, you know, near the lows in the grain market, there's there's still a lot to do out there and a lot to think about, you know, from crop insurance perspective and a basis and and carry and you know what do i do with this crop i'm about to to harvest uh, there's there's a lot to a lot to think about and and certainly uh, the markets are not where you want to you know put on the back burner even as we're about to get busy with harvest for sure chip appreciate you being on the podcast man we'll catch you again next time all right thanks for having me on casey all right on i'm casey seymour with moving iron podcast check me out on facebook twitter and instagram at moving iron llc go to linkedin at moving iron podcast <laughs> Check the video version of this out at the YouTube channel, which is the Moving Iron Podcast YouTube channel. And you can also go to movingironllc.com for everything Moving Iron related. If you're in finance, if you're in the markets, if you're in you know, analysts for uh, Wall Street or whatever it is, and you're a dealer, whatever that might be, uh, Moving Iron Summit is a place you should probably t- check out. Chip's going to be there giving his uh, rundown of what's going on in the commodity. But if you're looking to see what's going to happen in the new equipment marketplace, the new equipment marketplace, when it comes to farm equipment, that's the best place for you to go find what's going on in the world. So check that out. If you want more information about that, send me an email at Moving Iron Podcast at MovingIronPodcast.com, and I will get back to you ASAP. So with that, I am Casey Seymour. We're Chip Nellinger. Let's move some iron, folks. Out. Iron Podcast is brought to you by these great sponsors. Are you looking to value your equipment more accurately? Target the right buyers and close more deals? Reach your ideal customer? Then look no further. Fusible isn't just about ag data. It's about action. Our best-in-class solution empowers you to value your equipment accurately, make informed decisions, and find the perfect prospects. Ignite your dealership's growth at Fusible.com slash Moving Iron dash podcast. Out in the field, every decision counts. You wouldn't plant without testing your soil, so why would you prospect blind? Introducing EDA, your one-stop shop for ag equipment intel. EDA goes beyond specs and prices. You get deep dive data on every piece of equipment like UCC filings that help track ownership changes and uncover potential sales leads. D&B firmographics, which help you understand the financial health and buying power of potential customers. Market trends that help you stay ahead of the curve and insights on equipment demands and pricings. With EDA, you're not just looking at data, you're seeing opportunity. Find the right buyer, sell smarter, and build lasting relationships. Visit edadata.com for your free demo and unlock the power of knowledge. For over 80 years, Iron Solutions has been your go-to data source for ag dealers, lenders, and manufacturers. Get powerful appraisal and value forecasting tools that fuel profitable decisions anytime, anywhere. Get your free demo at ironsolutions.com. Iron Solutions, confidence in every click. Today, there are many ways to finance ag equipment. But nobody delivers simple, fast, or flexible financing like AgDirect. Learn more about your options to buy, lease, and refinance equipment at agdirect.com. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 for all your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. This podcast is proudly provided by Axon, helping dealers move more iron for the past 100 years. Find out more at axontire.com. Move more iron with Axon. Moving iron in the 21st century.